What is a sequence? What is a sequence for? How do we make a sequence? Those are the questions we're going to answer in this video. Sequences are a new asset type in the recent 2.3 update uh, that come with a fancy new editor and lots of untapped potential. Uh, this is the sequence editor. It's a complex animation editor, uh, somewhat reminiscent of Adobe After Effects, if you've ever used that, uh, that allows you to create a complex sequence of animations by altering the properties of assets, sounds, and instances, uh, and even other sequences uh, over a duration of time. As you can see, we've got kind of a timeline of different assets, this little slime guy and different uh, animations, uh, having his move, his position adjusted over time, playing back the animation, uh, adjusting in a little jump arc there, and then adjusting our um, cat's position and animation over time okay we can do that with assets um sprites sounds even instances that have game logic and do all kinds of uh, fancy different things the most obvious use of a sequence like this is creating a cutscene or an animation within your game uh something that used to be a, a pretty tedious task as uh, we've never had a a visual way to do that kind of thing until now if you've ever used a timeline based animation editor before be it like after effects or even something like flash um, it probably won't be too difficult to pick up how to use this tool, but it is uh, a little bit uh, fiddly in places, or at least in its sort of initial launch version here, uh, version 2.3. Um, so this is a quick primer video on how it all works. So here is a blank sequence. This is what you'll be looking at when you make an entirely new sequence, uh, a blank canvas, blank dope sheet, blank track panel, blank everything, nothing in it. Um, the first things you want to be looking at are the main settings for your sequence, uh, starting with this unlabeled box uh, over here um, in the corner, which is the duration of the sequence in frames. Uh, default to 60 um, with a speed over here, um, which is labeled uh, 60 FPS. Okay, so by default, you create a one second long um, sequence uh, that will be played at, at 60. 60 frames at 60 frames per second, okay? Uh, we're just going to create a short, simple animation just to sort of show you how this works in this video. So 60, uh, a 60 frame long animation at 60 frames a second, second long thing, that's fine for us. So we're going to leave those at their defaults. Um, and I'm going to open up sprites and bring in our uh, little slime boy um, who has graciously volunteered to be a part of this tutorial to show us how uh, sequences work. Uh, you just kind of click and drag by the way, to place uh, a thing in, in the canvas. Um, currently, I don't know if they'll change this, but you can't do it like in rooms, what that I'm used to, where you, you click on a thing and just hold Alt and click around. Um, you actually do have to drag it uh, onto the canvas. So uh, go ahead and do that. You do have these little smart guides that show up that are pretty handy. You see these pink lines? That's kind of a new thing in general in, in the room editor as well. And, uh, uh, 2.3 you can see you can just sort of line things up to other assets uh, like their centers and edges and also the center um, like uh, the center axis horizontal and vertical of like the origin point as well uh, it's worth pointing out you can move the origin around as well so I can click and drag this uh, and that behaves the exact same way as the origin for a sprite uh, so when we place our sequence in the room or we define its position in the room in some way Okay, um, how it's going to draw the whole uh, uh, animation of that sequence is going to be relative to that origin point in, uh, in, in the room, right? But what this bar represents is the duration of time that this asset um, exists in our timeline. Okay, we can see we've got S slime here. And if I just scroll along here, we can see him just sort of animating on the spot there but then when we get beyond this uh, red bar um, he doesn't exist anymore okay but we can drag that out to the full duration or even drag it up from the beginning if we don't want it to exist at the start so we decide exactly where this sprite lives in our timeline so now that he exists um, you see he automatically sort of has, the, the sprite just sort of plays on the spot by default um, how do we make our sprite actually move or do anything well if I expand this here, uh, we can see we have uh, the slime's position um, exposed. You can add other things to this as well. If I click this little plus button here, um, you can see we get all these other options. We get uh, rotation, uh, color multiply, image index, image speed, origin scales, different things, different aspects of uh, this particular asset 
that we can vary. Obviously, if you put like a sound on here, it'll have different things that you can vary over time. But these are the things that we can uh, we can vary over time with this um, with this line asset. We want to vary its position. Position is already here by default because it will have a position relative to the origin of the bat, right? Which is uh, currently minus 43, minus 11, just sort of off to the left from where the origin is. How do we make that like change to something else? Well, by default, this button will be ticked, which is automatically record changes, which means if we go to basically anywhere on our playhead by just moving um, uh, just moving this uh, like a uh, yellow arrow around, if we just move this to say we'll, we'll move it to like the halfway mark here, and then we click and just drag our uh, our sprite across. The canvas you can see when i've let go of him it's created this little white uh, not white blue dashed line from where it was to where it is now and it's created this little diamond uh on the timeline and if we now scroll back we can see we've kind of created um an animation from this position to this position because what we've done is we've created a keyframe okay um what that means if you've never used like animation software and this kind of thing before is that we've got uh, a property here with a certain value, okay? We had our position right at the start that has a keyframe um, that stores our position as being minus 43 and 11. Uh, by moving it um, over here, we've created a new keyframe where we have this position instead. And what the animation system does is in between that space of time, it linearly interpolates uh, based on like how close it is to each keyframe um what value it should be between the original value and the value it's moving towards okay so it knows it needs to be mostly there when it's over here and knows that it's only just started when it's over here and so on okay and it sort of interpolates between them you can actually uh change how it interpolates i believe as well if you right click on any track um most of them have like this interpolation option so you can change it between linear and off i don't know if other options are going to that in the future what they would be if it's off then uh, a keyframe will just snap so like it won't interpolate between so you can see here we're just still in that same spot but then when we get past this point um you can see it moves to that position uh, let's put that back on. I should also point out that I'm just scrolling over this to play it, but you can also obviously just press the play button. Um, you can press space as well to just sort of quickly play a sequence. Uh, it is also important to be able to create keyframes um, without the automatic thing. Like uh, you might just want to create a keyframe of uh, like a position um, uh, like halfway through a linear interpolation or create one manually with very specific values. Um, so you can click uh, this automatically record changes button to toggle it off and there are a few new ways to make your own um, keyframes uh, one is just to right click on uh, the track itself and go add key in place and that will add a new key here and then if we want to change it it's, it's it can be a little finicky this um, it's a little fiddly uh, if you're used to after effects uh, and so on but if i then click on the keyframe itself so it turns blue um, I can then modify it here by just changing these values. I can just change that to 50. Um, so now we've got like another little animation at the end here. So you can see he's got like a, a slower, comes here and then just sort of moves to this end a little bit slower at the end. The other thing you can do, and, and this is my preferred, it's just a bit non-obvious if you haven't worked with something like After Effects before, is this here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll zoom in this. Um, little area here next to a property track um, this allows you to both jump between different keyframes which is very important and useful for getting it like exact on the the timeline and also create and remove keyframes okay so if i'm just like if i go to the 56 frame mark and i click this uh center diamond you can see it like uh turns like a, a bright blue um, that means we've toggled on a keyframe. We can see it right there. And then if I click these little arrows, um, you see it says jump to uh, jump to previous key and so on. You can see we can move the playhead quickly between our different keyframes and also select them. You can see they turn blue ready for ready for editing. So then we can change those values right away. Um, but also if I if I'm on a keyframe and I just click this little blue diamond again, uh, that will remove that keyframe. 
uh, which is very useful. This is generally the tool I use just for adding and removing keyframes uh, when I'm doing After Effects stuff, and it's probably the tool I'll use the most for doing it um, here as well. So let's add another property in here as well, just so we can see how that works. Um, just working with position alone is a little bit boring. Um, so I'm gonna, let me just zoom in here for you all and go to this plus button, uh, hit scale, and that'll bring up a scale track uh, that allows us basically to do the exact same thing as we've been doing with our position, uh, vary it over time, um, but with the scale of the sprite instead. And obviously we've got all sorts of things in here, our image speed, image index, rotation, all kinds of cool things. Okay, um, so with the scale, we'll need to add a keyframe at the beginning. Here, okay, so it has like an initial value, otherwise like it's, it's you know, it's not gonna interpolate between not having a keyframe and a keyframe. You've got to go from one keyframe to the next. So you're going to have your initial keyframe, which is just 100% scale. Um, say we don't want to start scaling right away though, we can have, go all the way to like 24 frames, uh, stick in another keyframe, which is also 100, 100, go to the 30th frame, add in another keyframe, and then maybe we uh, select that keyframe and change the scale up to like 120 width, uh, 120 height, um, which will then create a little uh, growth <laughs> in him there where he starts sort of moving slowly, just sort of gets uh, gets a bit bigger and then just starts moving moving slowly. So you get the basic idea, okay? You, you add properties, you vary things over time, you can, obviously I can bring in multiple different assets and add their own properties and have them uh, appear and exist at different times in the animation to do different things. Um, we can combine these together to create various different complex things. The last thing I'll mention in here um, is that we can uh, change the playback mode by clicking this button here to make this say a looping um, sequence. And this isn't just for the sake of previewing what it would look like repeating. This actually makes it a repeating sequence. So then if I just sort of placed it in the room as an asset, it would play on repeat. If we click it again, we can go to ping pong mode as well. So it'll sort of play forward and then play backwards, which can be useful for a bunch of different things as well. Or we can just toggle it off and be have it be a sequence that just plays once and ends, okay, as we, we might have if we're doing something like a cutscene, okay? Uh, so here, just to demonstrate, as I did at the start of the video, um, this is a slightly more complex uh, sequence than what we've just made. Um, and as you can see, it looks maybe a little bit different down here, not just because we've got all of these different properties going off, um, but um, I've also done some stuff with animation curves in here as well. Animation curves are another new resource type, although the resource type of an animation curve doesn't necessarily have to come into sequences itself to use the concept of animation curves. You can embed animation curves that are sort of local to a sequence and only specifically for like a given sequence. Um, for a particular type of movement, and that's what I've got going on here with this position. If you right-click on like any like um, property track, uh, you can uh, click this uh, convert to embedded anim curve button, or also set to external anim curve if you want to set uh, it to match an animation curve that you've pre-created. Although I think that's a rarer use um, use case. Uh, here I've just been using like uh, the convert to embedded. Uh, anim curve, like if I just do that here just to demonstrate on like the slime uh, slime's position, um, it won't actually do anything to the movement right away, it just sort of converts it directly into a um, animation curve. What, I, what on earth does that mean? What am I talking about animation curve? So if I click open editor on this after converting it to a curve, we get a little graph that shows like how the value changes over time. So I mentioned at the start, it's going from one keyframe to another, so it's going from this value to this value, but we can see that linear interpolation over time and how and where it is at different points in that. Um, we, which means we can also add points and sort of vary how it gets there, sort of adding our own kind of keyframes and controlling that. And we can also click this button to create a, um, to change between being just a linear curve and a smooth curve. So we can create kind of an eased effect on uh, various different movements. So you can see this movement behaves a little bit bit weirdly now like there's just like a little bit of a pause there where he sort of slows the stop and then carries on again right because we've created this sort of change in the movement this isn't perfect yet um this is kind of more of a sign of things to come in my opinion because there are no um what's called bezier handles on the curves to allow you to sort of define them 
more precisely. At the moment, it's just either linear or it is a curve. You can't really define much about how the curves work without adding in a bunch of keyframes. Um, and also at the moment with X and Y specifically for doing positions, um, you'll notice when I added the keyframes on X, it's also added some keyframes on Y, which is fine because Y isn't doing anything, but if they were both, um, like I can't make this uh, a linear graph and this one a curved graph, for example, they, they're they both either curved or bo uh, both smooth or both linear. Um, and that can cause a few little issues. But I think this is going to improve as time goes on, and this is the most basic implementation of the, the curve stuff um, so far. Obviously, we could also put in things like sound effects. Um, I don't have one to hand, but we could, like, we could go in here, like the moment this hits here, we could drag in a sound effect asset and have it play at that point. It's a nice, simple way to synchronize sound effects um, uh, with different areas of your animation or your cutscene or whatever. Um, and then obviously once we've built a sequence, you know, how on earth do we use it? Well, the simplest way to use it is to just go into a room and stick it in the room, right? Here's, here's one I made earlier, but I'll delete that. You'll want an asset layer. Uh, that's where they go on. They're not instances or anything like that. But then um, you can just go and place them in the room like any other asset, okay? Um, so I can just plunk it down there. Obviously, it's relative to its origin point uh, as defined in the sequence. Our origin is all the way over here. So that's its coordinate. Um, like at the start there, kind of near where the slime is. Um, so that's how like it gets positioned around the room, okay? And then, as I said, I think this one is it. No, no, it's at the loop at the moment because I was just showing it off. But if we set it to play once, when we come to the room, we just sort of place this in the room. If I run the game, um, you can see it'll like play the sequence through once and then it'll just stop. And now there's all sorts of things you can do. You can have uh, your sequence set to like broadcast event and maybe do some code or like, um, like involve instances and objects and logic uh, in your sequences to do all sorts of crazy other creative fancy things. Um, but rather than just sort of go into like all the possibilities of sequences, I think the next thing I'm going to do um, is create a video showing you a practical example of sequences in creating something like a simple cutscene in um, like something like our ARPG. We could use that as a base, um, but it won't assume you've done the ARPG series. It'll be something like you know, just assuming you have a game and you want to make a cutscene. We can finally do it, everyone. We can finally make um, the, the the prophesized cutscenes tutorial. Um, so I think that will be a good place to start in showing you a bit more of what sequences can actually do. But hopefully you understood the basics of that and uh, you can start experimenting yourself and seeing what kind of fun um, stuff you can come up with. Uh, the manual's got a ton of information. We haven't even touched on any of the GML stuff that you can do. You can define all kinds of things to do with sequences in there, like how they're played uh, and, you know, um, change the properties of them on the fly and all kinds of cool stuff. Okay, um, hope you enjoyed that one, guys. Um, cool. This is a cool new feature. I think it's a little bit fiddly in a couple of places, uh, but I think it'll get better as time goes on. Um, and uh, I, I really look forward to seeing what people can do with it. Cool. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll catch you all next time. A huge thanks, as always, to my amazing Patreon supporters, without whom None of this work would exist. A big thanks in particular and in no particular order to the following. Max M, Bowser the Dog, Robert Churches, Daka Dondigo, Bertie T, Hyungjin, James Siggins, James L. Anderson, Jason, Darkrider0318, Hare, Rupinder, Zephyr Flame, Renny Dam, Samir and Yai Legaglow, Mark Burgess, Scott Matthews, Leo, Cabbage Pants, Relentless Rex, Figgy, Zach Collett, Yoram Pater, Troy Mera, Goose, Alex Schenkel, Justin Adega, Carter Green, Kaiser Ho, Andrew Gilbert, Kimpo, Phil Keen, George Bailey, Vacants, Dalvor, Jordan Hake, and Mr. Oz. Thank you all so much, and thank you, of course, for watching. I'll catch you all next time.